My name is Harry Blackstone Copperfield Dresden. Conjure it by your own risk. I'm a wizard. Hey everybody, it's Mike Badger from Badger Dad, and we're back with another video. Today we're going to go into the Dresden Files Stormfront, Full Moon, and Great Peril, our deep dive. And we're going to talk through these three books, the things I really like about them. There are going to be spoilers. If you haven't read the series before, I suggest you check out my spoiler-free review of these three books on the channel. And if you like Dresden Files in general, I'm going to be doing quite a few reviews as well as deep dives. So please subscribe to the channel, notification bell, like button, all that jazz to help with the algorithm into what I really like about the first three books and how Jim Butcher sets up the foundation of what will become the much broader series Dresden Files. I want to start off in the very beginning. Harry is introduced in chapter one. Introduced as the, the noir genre detective. Young man, moody, down on his luck, struggling with rent. Nobody takes him seriously. He has a special eye for things that society doesn't necessarily know. Those stereotypical points, check mark, check mark, check. That's not so much what interests me. I think what I really I thought was interesting was the Carmichael and Murphy scene that happens right after when Harry goes to investigate the murder, the first big murder, blood, guts, gore, dead people. And he meets with these two police figures. You have Carmichael and you have Aaron Murphy. I forget. He is here used to represent the skeptical humanity of the wider police institution. And Murphy is that person who's, she's a little skeptical, but she's open to fantastical. She's open to the magical side of the world in a way that others aren't. She's doing it here. It's implied that she's doing it because it's her job. I think that she has something more that Jim Butcher develops later on, and maybe we'll get to the later reviews. My thoughts about where he's bringing Murphy to over time. But here he's planting the seed where Murphy is willing to believe. She's willing to listen. And there's not a lot who will do that. So she is that connection between these, this broad institution of humanity, police and state represented here by Carmichael and Murphy and their dynamic of hitting against one another. And where Murphy says Carmichael to leave the room. All of that seems, it's just scene setting and just character development, but it is already getting the reader into this aha so most people are are skeptical of the magical side of things it's hidden it's closed up maybe jim hits it he hits that beat a bunch of times in the first couple books but i thought it was brilliant how he set up these two characters to represent institutional tensions over time so that was really cool then there's the scene with marcone where harry is intercepted by marcone he's already off his game and stressed and then marcone uses that to get a soul gaze out of him soul gaze is this look into the soul through the eyes. Really convenient, especially in the early books. Jim loves to do soul gaze as a, ah, oh, my eyes are catching yours, but I looked away in time. And other times he looks and it's immediate the effect and bam, you're sucked in. And I see the soul gaze as a literary device, but I think over time it does become a little bit more concretized, the rules around what the soul gaze is like. In this case, either way, Harry has the soul gaze Marcone. And they're setting this up because it makes it where Marcone and Dresden are the first people we meet, even throughout the first book, the first people we meet, where they have a true understanding of one another. I say that because the soul gaze from Harry, other people looking into Harry's eyes, typically leads to them being distressed. Something about looking at Harry is bad. Marcone isn't phased at all. Now, that's important because that means that Marcone has assessed Harry from the inner depths of his soul and finds him a peer of respect. And that is something that is already, this is chapter two, three, it's very early in the book. That's already building a relationship of one where they can meet eye to eye, is used more of a judge of character rather than an event that leads to someone breaking down or freaking out or having some sort of horrific reaction. We meet with Bianca. This is just scene setting, but the vampires overall in the Dresden verse are awesome. Uh, I'm probably going to do a video separately of them to talk through the courts and their nuances because as I've reread this series, I'm up to deadbeat right now. As I've been rereading through, there's so much nuance and detail to the, the vampire courts and their dynamics and the other aspects of the world too. I know the fairies and such. But with the vampires, I really love what he's been doing with it in a way I never quite appreciated in the past, reading it casually. Then there's a bunch of questions. <laughs> there's a bunch of questions. But before I get to those, I just want to jump in. The end climactic fight I thought of Stormfront wasn't super awesome. It was fine. It worked. It wasn't awesome. The best fight is the scorpion fight both in terms of the tension 
as well as the way the gym writes an action scene. Pretty much nobody I've read where the action scenes, even this early, this is book one, are so gripping. He really understands how to keep your attention. It's like playing hot potato. He jumps from point to point of where the action is. It's always about following the action. It's not just about sticking with a character if the action is not following the character. Each hit, each punch, each kick. If you ever watched the first Deadpool movie, in that first scene where it's slow motion, each punch, each kick, each twist is slowly highlighted with little you know, jokey text. It's kind of like that. That's how he approaches combat scenes where he builds them and makes you follow them. And it's brilliant here. The scorpion fight is just amazing. Really what cemented my appreciation for Jim's skill as a writer of, of action scenes and he really needs it because he's going to have a lot of action scenes in the series. So there was a bunch of things that I thought were kind of weird and suspicious reading through the first book. One is that there's this weird description of Harry and Murphy entangled in shadow. It's page 12 in the paperback, but it's bizarre. It's like there are shadows cast on the floor in next to, I think it's an elevator. And it says something about them like lying on top of each other, but it's a creepy, weird feeling. It could just be the Harry Murphy dynamics always going to be a bit tense and they're close and then apart and close and apart. Maybe that's what it's implying, but there was just really weird description. We also had Justin DeMorne's death described very in passing. It comes up in later books. It's already super suspicious because the way Harry described it, it's almost like, oh, yeah, and this happened and this happened and then I, I beat him and then yay. It, it's very glossed over. It's almost like Harry's kind of suppressing the memory. We also had the three eye. This is a question that the first three books all tackle, which is that the thing going wrong magically in the first three books are something that someone else is artificially causing. They're not accidental. There's some, in this case, it's this three eye. It's like an LSD that makes people see magic. You get the wizard sight, but they're not prepared for it. So it ends up driving them crazy. It's a drug that's mass produced and could be used. Almost, I don't know if it falls within the, with the laws of magic in terms of manipulating people's minds, but that's what it comes across as. And there's a scene where Harry is running into someone on it and he sees this being he who walks behind and this is just briefly referenced as some sort of spirit hunter that DeMorne sent after Harry. But later on in the series, this becomes much more important. And lastly, there's a mention of power of circles. Now, anybody who's read Wheel of Time, this is something that's a really big deal in the Wheel of Time magic system. That is the circles. Men and women can form together magic, Satan and Sadar. They can form circles that enhance the overall power of the effect. It's implied here. This is, I think, the only place, at least in the first handful of books, that something like this is mentioned. This notion that 13 wizards can pull their power together, never more than 13. I'm sure it's going to come up later. Otherwise, why would it be here? 13 wizards pull their power together. And so the question here is, there are some implications. You can get super powerful just yourself. If you use rituals, if you use other things to supplement yourself or to get power from others and get it into your own body and your own ability or using an artifact, that's enough. The notion that you need to build a circle starts to come into question even in these the first six or so books, which means there's probably a lot more to this than is explained. But it's referenced at the very end of the book, and I thought it's going to come up again, like possibly needs 13 wizards together. And what does that look like from a power scale? I'm interested to know. And so those are my notes on Stormfront. Let's talk about Full Moon. And there's a bunch of stuff in these first books that's suspicious. The werewolf belts, Full Moon's werewolf belts are to Stormfront's LSD third eye, the same sort of thing. It's an artificial force that's creating darkness and problems for Harry. In Full Moon, the werewolves overall, that made it a lot more interesting to me than the plot. It was fine. We we're introduced to four to five different kinds of werewolves. It all is played out in a very short amount of time. I don't know if it, I don't, it's a short amount of time, but somehow Jim manages to to keep it interesting. It kind of begs the question if he ran out of the werewolf thing. Like he did it in the first six, seven books. Werewolves don't come back much later in the series. There's not a whole lot of the multiple kinds of werewolves coming up again. So we'll see if it, if it really matters later or if he just, he got it out of his system. Werewolves exist. Here's a bunch of them and it's not going to matter so much later. I don't know. But I thought it was interesting the way he did werewolves. I really like that. So we had a few characters. We had Chauncey, the demon sophisticate. And it reminded me a bit of Good Omens having someone like Chauncey who's British he side. I like that dynamic. And there was a bunch of stuff Chauncey implied already about Harry's parents and their death, deaths, and how there's questions about all the that sort of stuff. It, it already sets up the stage for a whole bunch of stuff to come. And then we also had the belts themselves, that there's something more to it because it's implied that you can learn the werewolf skills, magical skills, 
through the, the this notion that you don't need to use an artificial item to do it. And this, so you have the humans who are more normal become wolves, and it's more of us. They're still themselves, just in a wolf form. And then it goes to the opposite end of evil, where you're you're cursed, where you have zero control, which is the loop guru. And then these belts kind of sit in the middle, where the belts are leaning towards the loop guru curse, and you can turn them on and off when you want. But it's not really true you can turn them off when you want, because however they're created or infected, they make someone bad, even if they were originally a very good or positive force. And that's towards the end of the book with Denton, that's what's said is it just took a good man and just corrupted him, which seems to imply it's as bad in some ways as the loop guru, if not worse. If you had a belt, would it just make you like, do you need that discipline and keeping of your own self the way that Tara West was teaching Billy and crew? Do you need that in order to stay sane and stay yourself? And the belts have to be corrupting? Or is it that these specific belts that were given to these specific people were corruptible this way? That was a question I had coming out of it. And I think it's a, a pretty big one because we know somebody big is behind these things. These aren't, this isn't just casual magic, little things going on. And we see uh, in some of the, sh- the short stories where casual magic goes on. <laughs> this is not casual magic. Some Someone serious is behind this stuff. There's a couple other suspicious, weird stuff. One was potions. So potions are coming up even in book four or five, six, at least in one or two of those, you still have potions around. Um, from what I remember, potions in the wider series don't happen at a certain point. Either Harry gets strong enough, he doesn't need them. Maybe that's the idea. Or it's just too technical a system and too limiting a system. Deus Ex Machina with the potions. So he wants to stay away from that. I don't know. It's He put a lot of technicality into these first books, describing, explaining how the potions worked and so on. Eight different parts and aspects and how the formulas work and when it works and when it doesn't work. So I kind of think we want to see potions more. Or maybe it was just this is in the earlier books and we're not going to see so much of them later. But I thought it was strange how he spent a lot of time on them, and yet they are important early on, and they become less and less important as I'm reading forward. There's there's a bunch of implications about Harry's past and how he's named after stage magicians, Harry, Blackstone, Copperfield, Dresden, Harry Houdini, and Blackstone, the stage illusionist. His Harry's dad himself was a stage magician, although we don't know. We know he's vanilla mortal, but it's weird how he died same way with his mom. How did his mom get together with him? All that's kind of weird and suspicious. So, But then there's a question of what was Chauncey's note about Harry's mom, that her coming was awaited with great anticipation. The Dark Prince lost her in the end, her redemption and the unnatural deaths of your father and mother. So there's a lot to unpack in that sentence in terms of what it could mean. Like, who exactly is the Dark Prince? Is it a Lucifer character? Is it actually a sa- Satan? Is it some kind of demon who had a personal grudge or some issue with her? Don't know. We also don't know what her redemption arc means. Was that mean she was cursed or she made a literal deal with the devil? Also unclear. And Harry thought that his dad died naturally. So the fact here could just be he's lying to him, but it's really hard to lie. Kind of like the Fae demons, they're good at seeding lies into the truth, but they really got to give a good chunk of truth. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot more to the Harry parent story than is let on, but he's seeding the notes even as early as book two. Then we have the chivalry self-awareness flaw. This isn't a suspicion. This is more of, I really disagree with a lot of the online commentary around Harry as a chauvinist and it being hard to read. I can't stand him. I can't stand his perspective. There's the A, getting into the boots. It's a first person perspective, getting into the boots of a 20 something year old guy who is under the stress level Harry is with the lack of release that Harry has and with potentially something that's intentional seeded into his character, this protectorate, almost overprotectorate of both women and children, although women are more who Harry deals with. He's extremely self-aware as a character flaw when he's being chauvinist. Murphy is always poking fun at him and he's acknowledging, yeah, you're right. This is probably a bit much what I'm doing here. Removes a lot of the, oh my God, he's sexist and terrible and he, he, you know, is terrible with women and whatever. Harry is struggling and developing as a man, as a person, as an orphan into an adult orphan who has never had a normal relationship and is working through those issues, and he's still extremely self-aware. There was one quote in the book I thought was really good. I hated to draw Susan into this. It made me feel cheap, weak. It was the whole problem with chivalry that I had. I didn't want a girl to be writing to my rescue protecting me. Didn't seem right. And I didn't want to endanger Susan either. 
there was a story involved, she'd go to hell itself to get it. And I had used that against her to le- lever her into helping me. And I didn't like it that I had. I thought better of myself. This happens a lot in book one, book two, book three. And even as the series goes on, he's very aware it's a character flaw. He's very aware that it shoots himself in the foot more often than not. But something drives him forward to do more. I'm waiting to see if that if Jim takes that somewhere where it's a twist on the trope of him being, you know, the, the trope in literature of the noir detective being a chauvinist. And Jim's end game is that there's a purpose behind it. And Harry, as a person, pushes through that purpose. Something is driving him to be a protector this way, while still at the same time being self-aware. So for me, I, I thought that was a really great paragraph, that it shows Harry's wrestling with it. And if someone is reading this and has an issue with it, that's fine. You can have your own perspective and issue with it. But this is not a straight-up noir, quote-unquote, sexist portrayal. That's not what it is. That is not what's going on here at all. Most of the time, there is purpose behind this stuff. There's also Harry's double. His subconscious is pushing him away from the, quote, chauvinism. That you're trying to protect Murphy all along instead of making her be able to protect herself. She's going to be fighting these things, and you won't always be able to babysit her. So you need to play coach, get her into shape to do what she needs to do. This is both good and bad. It's bad in that Murphy ends up in a worse place because of it. Harry's going to give her knowledge and help her get to a point where she can be independent in a world of nightmares when she's not the strongest, not even close to the strongest one on the block. So that is something that shows uh, Harry is self-aware of his un- his pr- almost problematic need to, uh, to protect people, overprotect people in a lot of ways. Having a bunch of people in his periphery who he builds and grows and develops into a, a gang, an army of people over the course of many books that are going to be independent, stronger, better developed people because he takes a step back and starts to pump the throttle on protecting by by giving people the tools to defend and protect themselves he is protecting them further and you see the payoff as the series goes on there also is harry and the alphas there's a scene later to my point about protecting people harry to the alphas at the end of the book says i don't want anyone to get killed not us not them maybe they deserve it maybe not i don't think we'd be much different than them if we went in planning to just murder a bunch of people It isn't enough to stand up and fight the darkness. You've got to stand apart from it. You've got to be different. And this is Harry building trust with people, but also setting a standard for how he views the world and what he does and what he aspires to. And by building that into the people around him, they push back on him when he starts to fail that standard, which I think is great. That's in a a couple books. I saved four to five werewolves earlier. You have the, the four werewolves that are established, but then there's an implication that Terra, the character, is a wolf who can shapeshift into a person, which is the opposite of what Billy and team do, where they shapeshift from person to wolf. So she retains her wolf cunning and ability and natural animalistic nature, and she tampers it with an artificial human nature, is what's implied, that she can turn from wolf to spirit. So she's actually more wolf than man, <laughs> of wolf and man, like Metallica. She's, she's more wolf than woman. I thought that was an interesting step forward, because later Harry himself is starting to deal with his own internal struggles. And one of them is this, his animalistic nature and his struggle against his animal self. So I wonder if, as the series progresses, that she mentions maybe we'll connect later in the future. If you come and visit me during winter time later on, maybe I will be there. She's, it's setting up where she can be someone to help Harry work through this struggle that he's having, even in the first few books. Yeah, I think Full Moon had a, packed an awful lot of punch in it, even though it was a short book, even though it's one of the worst plots in the series so far. But I thought it was really good. And now we'll move into Grave Peril, and we'll talk about Michael and Charity, Thomas and Justine, I guess. The the relationship aspect of the books in book three is the first time we're really getting relationships have a lot at stake. In the first two books, you have Harry and Susan. It's kind of a whatever relationship. Harry Murphy is a professional one. Most of the characters are single, not dealing with family, not dealing with the struggles of being married or being a long term in a long term relationship. That's not what's going on. By introducing the Mike, Michael and Charity and Thomas and Justine, Thomas and Justine as the the partner, we'll call it, mechanic, where they can't really ever truly be wedded, so to speak, but they are Michael and Charity as the formerly wedded, Christian, devoted um, people with, with an actual family and children. 
I think by introducing that to the series, what Butcher does is not only does he widen the scope by giving a lot more to lose, he gives characters that are much more down to earth and human by adding them into the series. It starts to push buttons in Harry's character and the other characters around Harry in a way that wouldn't be if he didn't have someone so normal rounding him down because Harry's life is crazy. And I think that's one of the things that makes Michael such a great foil is that Michael has a very black and white point of view of the world. And that is a contrast to Harry, who's very much a gray point of view in the world. He's agnostic in a lot of ways, not just about religion, but in a lot of things. He thinks about things. He thinks about both sides of them and kind of is whatever, man, you know, whatever I get gets through me through my day. But having someone who is black and white is a great contrast. Michael knows what's on the line. He has way more to lose than Dresden has. And that sets up also a differing dynamic where Harry expects that Michael will be there for him and is is one of his friends and will work with him and help him with things to the point where even he asks him in book three to leave charity, giving birth in the hospital. And he asks him to leave her to help him with something. So we get even early on, this is the first time we're meeting Michael in book three, we already see that Harry trusts Michael to this degree. And it's because I think Michael grounds Harry and gives him a taste of normal that he can't fathom. And so when he's beyond normal and he's in this messed up crazy world that he lives in every day, Michael is that that lightning rod point for him and helps him ground himself. Um, and I think that the Michael charity dynamic, Jim already had established early on. I don't think it's a throwaway here. I don't think the fact that she was pregnant and having another child among their many children was an accident by any means. Where Michael and Harry go Later, there's a bunch of stuff that we'll talk about. In this one, you have the ghosts breaking free. I said in, in Stormfront and in Full Moon, you have the belts and the three eye. A technically wizard, though this book we have the ghosts are being messed up. Something is weakening the never never. Something is cursing and hurting these ghosts and getting them all riled up. We're given a scapegoat in Kravos and in his whole nightmare situation. There's a lot more to that because there is a scene in the middle, middle of the book or so during the vampire ball, the vampire masquerade, where Harry goes as a fake vampire. And I, man, that scene, I totally forgot that scene. I don't know why. When I read it a while ago, but I totally forgot. Goes to a vampire masquerade dressed as a vampire. Completely, complete deadpan. is amazing. It's amazing. But there's a lot in that scene to unpack in terms of what's going to affect in the series and also where what I think Jim was doing. This is where Jim is build, setting the building blocks for the full series. I would say book one and two and a lot of three is about setting the building blocks of the world and just getting you set up. Book three is where he starts to, to knock over a few dominoes while also building way more. Like we're talking 10 to 20 books of foreshadowing. And the scene by that masquerade is huge. We have a couple of Weird cloaked figures. We have Amarakius gets stolen and given away. We have the, the Lian Shi, um, Harry's godmother, who is representing fairy. You have the Red Court represented by Bianca. So you have part of the vampire world represented there. Oh my God. Yes, you have the White Court represented there with Thomas. The Knights of the Cross represented there through Michael. So much to unpack in that scene. Um, we meet Ferrovax, who's a dragon. I don't know if it's the only, he's the only dragon left alive because. It sounds like Michael killed one of the dragons. Is Faravax the only one left? He says he's the oldest, most powerful. Is that true? Who knows? There is so much from that scene that's going to peter forward into the books. I'll probably, since I think I'm going to end up doing spoiler reviews for each of the books going forward, not three and one, it'll just be too long and too much for me to, to think through each time. It will talk more about that as the series progresses in terms of there's a couple of things that come up around Faravax, either in reference or mentioning dragons. Oh, speaking of, Mavra was there too. So all three courts were represented. Was the fourth court, fourth or fifth or X number of courts represented? Three ones we know about were represented there. That Farrah vaccine sets up a whole bunch of things in terms of what's to come and it gives us a taste into Michael's past as well. Very interesting. The ghosts are seem to be the magical twist that someone's riling them up, messing things up there. And it's coming from Mavra, who's the black court vampire, vampiress, but she's also a wizardress, a witch. And yet Mavra seems to be the one like, who's mess, who helped her become a sorceress. Is it just by luck, by chance? We don't meet a lot of other vampires that are this adept at sorcery. And it doesn't say exactly who she's working with and why she's doing what she's doing. So I think she was more the evil, dark infiltrator into Harry's life and Harry's world, messing with things. She's the one from this book 
that that's more relevant versus the wider red court situation that's going on. The thing I thought was the biggest weakness of the book was actually the nightmare. I thought the Kravos thing was really rushed, really tacky almost. He was too characterized <laughs> to take seriously. The nightmare and Kravos, connections were made really fast, but then Harry figuring out that it's not the demon and it's Kravos himself was super slow. A lot of uneven pacing there. I thought that was pretty poor for the plot. In terms of what was convenient in this book, something that was convenient. I said the soul gaze has been set up as a very convenient thing, but Susan losing her memories about Harry and then it being more or less forgotten about and ignored later on, that I think was also really just sloppy, sloppy writing. And I know Jim was trying to do a lot with this book, but there definitely were a bunch of sloppier plot elements going on in this book, more, I think, than book one and two, which were a little bit more sewn up. Barbed wire thing with Agatha Hagglethorn early on and the other spirits as well. What's that? What's up with that? Where'd that come from? How does that work? The whole freezing darkness, cold feeling with the wire. I wonder if that will be important later. There's some really great foreshadowing where Harry worries about Mr., his cat. And Susan's like, don't worry about Mr. He's as big as a horse. I pity a dog that tries something. Which is funny because I think that sets up for Mouse and living with Mr. That was really a hilarious scene. Really great. But this is already in book three where he says, I pity the dog that tries something with Mr. It's just brilliant. Little slipped in line. Doesn't seem like it matters, but man, the payoff later is big. Even for something little like that. Um, we also get a lot of foreshadowing for later. Uh, we meet Morty, who shows up a bunch of times, and he predicts a wider apocalypse between what's the biggest apocalypse that could happen, the barrier between our world and never, never falls apart and is torn away. Is that the biggest barrier, the human world and the spiritual world and never, never? Or is there more, because we know that there's an outside force, he who walks behind, whatever that was mentioned, there's outside forces. Are they also part of the Never Never? Are they beyond the Never Never? If they're beyond the Never Never, then is this really the apocalyptic point? It's a question. And Jim is setting a stage here where he makes it sound like that's the biggest problem. But then maybe later there'll be a bigger problem. It's like a step-to-step building of tension. It kind of gets a little annoying, Harry's irrational guilt that he can't protect everyone. No one else saw it, sees things this way, but I see things this way. I don't love his whole wallowing in self-guilt. And this is what Weekend, I'll talk about Summer Night in its own video, but this is what I thought hurt Summer Night was Harry's constant self-doubt and struggle with it, struggle with just getting his head out of the gutter. It's not all about him. It does lead for some good character development over time, but in the moment, this early on in Jim's writing career, it's a bit irritating. Um, it's a bit irritating. And we already established that he's, he is irrational in a lot of ways. But he has had let go moments in the first few books where he's with a Murphy, where he's like, okay, I'm not going to be way overprotective. I'm going to give her some space and try to get her to be independent. And here he's already setting up for a long drag of being miserable. Didn't care for that at all, but I can see why Jim did it. There's also, as I said, I'm going to talk about vampires in the home video, but Red Court had some weird fear about light. Like light shines in them and they're like, ah, oh, they're burning and melting, but they're not dead. So the whole like they're exposed to light and they die doesn't seem to affect the reds. But then later on, there are reds who come out in daylight or come out and are, are not as uh, not as affected. Is it age? Is there something more I want to dig into when I do the vampire video? I'm going to try to dig into some of these things, but it was but it's a little little weird. Some of the rule setting. There's also an inconsistency in a lot of the books this way. I don't know if it's just Jim's beta readers aren't catching it or it, it's kind of like whatever. There's too much going on to keep track of all the stuff. But there's a couple of scenes in these early books where Harry is in a hospital and with Michael and Charity at one point. He's like, he's in the hospital. He's getting checked or he's there waiting. And he doesn't have nearly the same thinking as he does in at other points where he's really worried about someone's pacemaker or messing with technology in someone's car, and yet he's in a hospital environment and doesn't think twice about it. Some of Jim's basic rules are a little loose, a little loose. That's okay. It's it's not a uh, super hard magic system. I get it. It's a little soft. And I'd say the last thing is that in the final scene of the book, the final big scene of the book with Bianca, Don Paleo Ortega show, show up at the door as if it was all a setup. And this comes up later 
where Harry is told, you know, you can't, it's not all your fault, the whole vampire court thing, because you were set up. True. It does already appear here to be a setup. So why is Harry beating himself up about it to the extent that he does? Probably because love and irrationality is in the mix. Susan's in the mix. But in this case, the fact that it's Pele Ortega that shows up again later, he's a big player in Red Court, that's already building blocks for the later series. And I thought it was it kind of would have been nice to see him at the ball a little bit more where someone said, oh, by the way, this is Pele Ortega. And maybe they did and I don't remember it. So overall, yeah, first three books, I like them a lot. Uh, I gave a bit of a deep dive into what I thought about these. There's a lot that goes on in these first three books, way more than I had remembered, a fraction of what I remembered from reading them years ago. And I think that, um, for one, I'm going to keep my own notes for this going forward. I'm going to keep those notes and try to track some of these points I've been making, some of these things that stood out to me, and see, aha, we, here's where it's showing up again, or here's where there's a gap, or whatever. I want to try to bring that forward in my other reviews, even though they're going to be, it's not going to be a spoiler free one. I think I'm just going to do them as all in in one video. In this case, like I said in the other video, Stormfront was my favorite. I think Full Moon was my least favorite plot, but had a lot of really great moments, even though the humor was a bit lacking and some of the the plot itself was less imagined, less imaginative. And Grave Peril packs a ton of information, a ton of stuff that goes on, but that leads to it being a lot sloppier and a lot more characterized than I had hoped. Wow. So Jim kicks it off to a great start, I think, and I look forward to going into Summer Night next. That will be with fairies. And we'll talk a bit about that book in the next video. Style video, I'll try to keep them on the shorter end, a little more concise next time because it'll be one book at a time. And if you guys enjoyed this, please stay tuned for future more by you click subscribe to the channel, notification bell. If you hit the like button, always appreciate it. Let me know what you think down below. I'll always love talking Dresden. And as always, Mike Badger signing out. I'll see you guys next time.